morning, everyone. Welcome to Florence Alliance Church. Please stand and sing with us this morning. morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful morning that you have given to us, Lord. We ask that you fill this place with your spirit. Be with us, Lord. Uh, speak to our hearts. Uh, change us to be more like you this morning. We just ask you to bless the service. Accept our worship, Lord, and um, just, yeah, bless, bless this time that we are here uh, to praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. You may be seated, please, and welcome to Florence Alliance Church. We are glad you're here this morning on this uh, beautiful day. Uh, it is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, this is October 30. Tomorrow is October 31, and I mention it not to celebrate Halloween, but to mention that uh, that is Reformation Day, the day that Martin Luther posted his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, and that touched off then the Protestant Reformation, which uh, re recovered things like the sufficiency of Scripture, that Scripture alone, we follow what Scripture says, and then faith alone and grace alone, that the gospel is that Christ died for us, rose again, bearing our sins as an atonement on the cross. Uh, and then it's through faith in Him that uh, we're saved. It's not by our own works. So uh, we sang the, the opening song, A Mighty Fortress, which is written by Martin Luther, just commemorates that. It's good to remind ourselves of those basic things of, of, from which, uh, of which we believe. And, and uh, anyway, so um, I mention that because I, I really want you to trust Christ too and not, and not in 
your good works, not in your church membership, not in your own baptism, but in what Jesus has done for you. So, uh, I wonder if you have your bulletin there. You might open it up. There are several things that we need to mention here this morning. And uh, this Thursday, there is a school group from Wisconsin coming. And they are going to be staying here at the church on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, leaving, I believe, early Sunday morning. And this is, they've been here before. Um, Every so often, I don't know if it's every two or three years, they bring a group to the uh, answers in, in the, the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, and that's what they're doing again, and we're hosting them. And uh, so I, I just mentioned that because on those evenings, there's going to be a lot of kids here, and so I don't know what kind of plans you might have, uh, cleaning the church, something like that. It's going to be a little complicated because of that. All right, uh, ministry leadership team on November 10, we have a meeting at 7 o'clock. Please note that. And then on November 13, and I, I want to mention that this, this insert here, the date is not correct. Uh, you know, usually it's a couple days off or something. This is three years. Um, <laughs> no, we, we, are, we are meeting on November 13 for our praise and thanksgiving service, which will then be followed by our Thanksgiving dinner together here at the church. So, so our praise and thanksgiving service is, as you are aware, a little different than our normal Sunday morning. Um, the members of the congregation are going to provide uh, the content that day in the form of perhaps special music. It might be s- solo. It, it might be an instrumental that you do. Uh, there might be uh, drama, if, if that's what you want to do. Uh, you may do it through some reading that is special to you and you think uh, illuminates some aspect of the glory of God and you would like to share that with our congregation. So there are different ways that you can participate that morning and uh, offering up a sacrifice of praise to God and then w- the congregation will join you in, in doing that. We offer it to the Lord. It's not a talent show, remember, but this is something we offer to the Lord for His glory, His praise. And so if you are thinking of some way you might participate, there is a sign-up sheet on the table back there, and I would appreciate if you would sign that with your name and then a a short description of what it is you're going to do because I will put that together then for that Sunday morning uh, in some uh, some order and and bring some order to it. So uh, again, we we enjoy that immensely. It is a great service that, that is one of the highlights of our year, and so I would encourage you to consider being uh, participating in that way. Also that day, we'll give you a chance to offer some testimony, so we might, we'll go around with an open mic, and, and if you would like to share something that the Lord has done for you in your life or for a family member or something throughout the year and want to share that, we want to hear from you that day as well, and again, everything is offered to the Lord. So that is November 13. And that's the service. But following the service, there will be a dinner, and it's going to be a, a carry-in dinner. Uh, you will be bringing some things, uh, we, we hope. And so this, this insert is directed towards that. And aside from the date, everything else in it is, is accurate and uh, kind of gives you the method and things that we're doing. And this is uh, Brenda, as Brenda puts that out. Um, so there, there is a sign-up sheet on that back table for that as well so that we know uh, what you might bring and uh, how many you're going to bring with you so we can plan for, for that. And it, it helps us a great deal to know uh, the dishes that you might bring and then how many will be with you as, as you attend that. So those, those sign-up sheets are back there. You can, you can see that. Uh, I think that's it then for my announcements this morning. I I want to invite you to take this Connect card, tear that off. There is a place for you to fill out your name, an address, phone number, email if you don't mind that. And also, uh, at the bottom of the sheet, there's, there's space where you can share prayer requests. If you would like me to pray for you for a specific matter this week, you can include it there. And I will receive those, and I will be sure to pray for you this coming week. Um, 
So as you're doing that, fill that out, and Marty is going to come and lead us in our scripture reading, and I just want to greet those who are joining us by live stream this morning, and we welcome you, glad that you are in attendance with us here. If you have a prayer request that you would like me to pray for, you can send your prayer request to my email address, which is leadpastor at florencealliance.org. That's lead pastor, L-E-A-D, lead pastor at florencealliance.org. And uh, even if you don't have a prayer request, it would be nice to hear from you, to, just to know that you're, you are tuning in with us, and we appreciate that. So Marty, why don't you come and lead us in our scripture reading this morning. This is found in the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. And perhaps you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, but you would like to follow along in the Bible. You can find this in the church Bible, which is uh, in, in the rack in the chair in front of you. Turn to page 877 there, and you will find this passage. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the Lord of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in words or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. So our mission's focus this morning, uh, we have some information in our bulletin on the upper right-hand side. You'll see international missions and regional missions. We'll be praying for both of those. And then our own local outreach as well. But if you have a bulletin, open it up, and there at the top, you'll notice we're praying for Europe and Germany and uh, some international workers, uh, Jose and Melanie Chinchilla, and they ask us to pray as they follow up with a specific congregation in Berlin, Berlin, Berlin where I'm from, Amish country, pronounced Berlin, Ohio, <laughs> Berlin in Germany, however. Uh, anyway, we're going to pray for them. They say pray for protection, strength, and wisdom as they pastor this group. And then they have a specific name here. Uh, they're praying for salvation, and we're going to join them in that as well, that God would reveal himself to Ted and draw him to himself and that he would come to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, we're also mentioning our, our regional mission this morning. We're thinking of the, the whole Columbus area as this is a region that is receiving many uh, immigrants and uh, refugees are coming there. And here's a list of some of the populations that, that I know are there, Ethi Eth folks from Ethiopia, Somali, Eritrea, Bhutan, Nepal, the Congo, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Iraq. Afghan, and, and there are others as well. Um, quite a few Asian Indians in the area. And we do, in fact, have church plants among several of these groups, some of them just starting. And so uh, having spoken with a few of them recently, I, I wanted to, our congregation to, to pray for them, to lift up these works and pray for them as they reach out. And, uh, you know, so, and, and we have, you know, so someone among the ne Nepali, he, he's, he's a Nepali. Uh, we have Bhutanese as well, and they're, being, they're a part of a, a church plant. So we're going to pray for them today 
And then we continue to pray for our own witness, each one of us as individuals, sharing our faith, and then through the ministries of our church that reach out. So let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. This is intercessory prayer in which we are joining the Lord in the task he's called us to, which is to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So let's, let's bow in prayer. Father, we give you thanks today because of your great compassion for your love for the whole world that uh, motivated you to send your only son, Jesus, uh, so that through him that the world would not be condemned but saved because he has borne the sins of the world. We give you thanks, Father, for this good news that we have to share. And we pray, Lord, not only for ourselves or even uh, the international workers that, that we've sent out, but we pray for all evangelical believers who are carrying the name of Jesus, who are reaching out and in love sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're grateful for these efforts all over the world. A few weeks ago, we had a representative of the Gideons here, and uh, with the, the, the handing out of, of Bibles uh, all over the world as well. And we thank you, Lord, that this testimony, this witness is available because of the efforts of so many. Father, today we want to think of this specific uh, missionary family, these international workers, Jose and Melanie Chinchilla. And we're grateful for their work, Spanish speaking in Berlin. And Father, we, we hold this congregation before you. We, we do pray for their protection, for their strengthening. We ask God that you would give to them wisdom and compassion as they serve the people there. We pray, Father, that you would unite believers' hearts together in, in not only in, in a like faith, but a like mission, and that through their dedication to you, uh, their love for Jesus, their love for people, that you would guide them then in the mission to which you've called them. We pray, God, that as you guide them, you would empower them with your presence, that you would manifest your presence there in, in ways that would um, draw those who do not yet know you, that would draw them to Jesus. And we pray that you would help uh, our international workers to remain faithful to you, that you might encourage them and, and strengthen them in their, in their hearts, that you might protect their families and, and Lord, continue to use them for your glory. We do want to lift to you this man, Ted, and we thank you that you are at work in his life. We ask God that you would arrange uh, circumstances in his life, that you would place people in his path, that you would quicken his mind and his heart to understand the gospel and the word of God, and Lord, that you would lead him to a place where he might exercise saving faith in Jesus Christ. Father, as we pray for a man like Ted, we think of folks in our own uh, network of friends and family and co-workers and fellow students, people that you place in our path, and those things that we prayed for Ted, we, we pray for those individuals with whom you are entrusting to our witness. Help us to be faithful, help us to be bold, help us to be clear, help us to be willing to obediently uh, share our faith and lift up the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for open doors of opportunity that would be given to us as witnesses. And Lord, we know that as those open doors may come, uh, Paul reminds us that there will be many enemies as well, many adversaries, he says. Uh, and so, God, we pray just for faithfulness, uh, the, for perseverance for protection, and, Lord, obedient hearts. Father, we're grateful for what you're doing in the Columbus area and for, for the, the mission field that is coming there. And we're thankful that you are raising up laborers in this harvest field. And we have met some of them, Father, and we pray your blessing upon them and your wisdom to be given to them. And, Lord, that they would overflow with love and that uh, your word, your gospel, would be given in a manner that is easily understood 
in the heart language of the people that they're trying to reach. Father, thank you for these opportunities, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and worship with us today.
hear me. I said, that was beautiful. Um, how many knew that last song? No? Did anybody raise your hand? Is that an, is that an old song? Once before, but is it an old song? Or is it something new? Oh, okay. That was, that was beautiful. Yeah, it is really good. Um, and I especially appreciate it this morning um, from the question that was asked in Sunday school. Well, not we don't have Sunday school. In our life group, early morning life group today, discussion that we had, that song is a wonderful follow-up, and it blessed me. Uh, thank you. We're going to continue in our study on Acts chapter 11, uh, beginning at verse 19, reading through verse 30. And this is part five of our study on the church at Antioch, entitled The Characteristics of a Great Church. So if you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 11, verse 19. I'm going to read the whole chapter. You can follow along as I do so. Again, if you are using one of the church Bibles, you can turn to page 820. And if you are at live stream, maybe you have a Bible with you there, I would encourage you to, to open it up and turn to this passage. But I'm going to start reading here, Acts chapter 11 written by uh, the same author of the Gospel of Luke, so written by Luke, um, but really written by the Holy Spirit through Luke, right? And, and uh, these are the words that Luke was inspired to write and which were preserved for us and which we appreciate so that we might know the heart and mind of God in the Scriptures. Follow along there, verse 19. It says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Clodius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Would you pause with me for a moment of prayer? Lord, we are grateful for the Scriptures because they reveal to us your heart and your mind. They also reflect back to us what is in our heart and mind. They are many times as a mirror to us. And we would pray that as we are uh, encouraged and instructed, that we would, when we turn away, from the mirror, not forget what we saw, but would put in practice so that we are doers of the word and not hearers only. So Lord, we pray for the grace to respond in a way that would please you and would bring glory to the name of Jesus. We pray this in his name, 
Amen. So as I mentioned, this is the fifth in the series on the characteristics of a great church. And when we started this series back September 25, I believe, uh, I explained what I meant by a great church that, that day. And if you'll recall, I said I'm not talking about a great church as being a large one or a famous one or an important one or the flagship church of a denomination or one in which the pastor is invited to speak at conferences and any of these things. What I mean by calling a church a great church is that we would be everything that God intends us to be for the sake of His kingdom. Another way to look at it is to be the kind of church that Jesus would lend His name to. The church at Antioch in Acts 11 has been our model and we've noted these characteristics so far, and they're, they're found on this outline that is included in uh, the bulletin. And for those who are watching by, uh, online by YouTube or Facebook, um, there, there is uh, an outline that's available there as well. And uh, the upper part of that is already filled in. The lower part is not, and we'll be, we'll be doing that part today. But if you look, uh, the characteristics that we've noted so far as we've learned from the church here at, at Antioch, you see that a great church practices every member evangelism. So every person in the church is sharing their faith. Uh, a great church is one that is inclusive of all people, that everyone is welcome. Every, we know that we need Christ, everyone needs Christ, and we welcome everybody and share our faith and bring them into the family of God and treat them as brothers and sisters. A great church is marked by the influence of godly leaders and how important it is for a church to have godly leaders. And we talked about godly character. Barnabas was an example, and we've, we've listed some things there. And then we talk about the godly ministry that Barnabas and others had there. He had a ministry with Paul. He had it with John Mark. And you can see the, the, the kinds of things that we talked about listed there um, with some depth when we covered those specific points. So I want to finish today by looking at three more characteristics of a great church. Three more characteristics of a great church. And each of us should ask ourselves whether we are the kind of disciple needed to make a church great. Am I the kind of disciple that uh, helps a church become everything that God intends that church, this church, to be for the sake of his kingdom. So we are on Roman numeral four, <laughs> if you're following along there on that outline. So the fourth characteristic of a great church that I want to mention here today is one that is committed to discipleship committed to discipleship and if you have the outline you can fill that in there that's the word that is missing the word discipleship look at verses 23 and then I'll jump down to 25 but but follow along as I read verse 23 it says when Barnabas arrived now the church in Jerusalem sent him to Antioch when they heard what was happening. It says, When Barnabas arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Now verse 25. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus. So he left Antioch. He went to Tarsus to look for Saul, also known as the Apostle Paul. Saul. He went to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Barnabas was sent to Antioch by the church in Jerusalem to see what the Lord was doing there in that place. A report had come back to them that something unusual was occurring. Both Jews and Gentiles were responding to the gospel. We talked about that with the very first point, I think, 
the second point that we, we had in our series. But, but something unusual was occurring where they were sharing their faith not with people of Jewish background alone, but also with non-Jews, or as the Bible terms them, Gentiles. So both Jews and Gentiles were responding to the gospel, and a community of faith had formed that included people from both of these ethnic and cultural groups. They were coming together as one. Now Barnabas was sent to evaluate this. He came and he recognized that there was a tremendous movement of God, and so he encouraged these believers to go on with the Lord. And the Lord continued then to pour out His grace there in Antioch, using the church, using Barnabas and Saul, uh, uh, bringing many new converts to Christ, no doubt among both Jews and Gentiles. So they continued this trend. And as Barnabas went and saw this occurring, it wasn't long before he knew that he needed some help. And so he went to look for Saul of Tarsus. Saul, later known as Paul, was uniquely qualified to help these converts. And uh, Barnabas remembered Saul. As you remember in, in one of our previous messages, Saul had been a persecutor of the church, converted on the road to Damascus, but right after that, the, the church was afraid of him. You know, they, they, they knew his reputation as uh, seeking to destroy the church. Barnabas went, met Saul, heard his story, and then took him in to meet uh, the apostles to let them know that he genuinely was converted. So B Barnabas went, searched for Saul. Now, Saul had been trained as a Pharisee himself. He called himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, he would have a lot of credibility among Jewish people, especially Jewish converts. But Saul also was a citizen of Rome at Tarsus. His parents were citizens there. He lived there when he was young. And so he was well acquainted with Greek culture. He was well acquainted with pagan religion. And he was well acquainted with the Greek philosophers. And so he had both of these uh, cultural uh, identities or this understanding of the culture he had both of these in his back pocket uh, he understood it well and so he was so thoroughly equipped to be of help to Barnabas here in this church that was bringing together people from both Jewish background and Gentile pagan background and so Barnabas and Saul returned to Antioch and it says, for a whole year they met with the church at Antioch and taught a great number of people. This demonstrates then not only a commitment by uh, Barnabas and Saul to discipleship, but this is also a commitment by the people of the church at Antioch to discipleship. This church was committed to discipleship. They wanted to learn. They wanted to be taught um, now, what is it, do you suppose, that Barnabas and Saul taught them? Well, I'm pretty sure it would be the same as the pattern of the church that was in Jerusalem. We're told there on the day of Pentecost when they gathered in 3,000 people into the church, folks who came to faith in Christ, it says that they met there afterwards and continued in the apostles' doctrine. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. We read that in Acts 2, 2. In other words, they were learning all they could about Jesus, how he fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures. They learned about his kingdom reign, and they learned about the implications of his death and resurrection for anyone who would believe in him and how they were to live for Christ. So the people at Antioch, these new believers, these converts from both Judaism and the Gentile world were hungry for the Word of God. And they were devoted to learning about and knowing Jesus Christ. So the Apostles' Doctrine is what we now have in the Gospels and in the letters that are preserved for us in the New Testament. Together with the foundation of the Old Testament, this makes up the Word of God. Like those disciples in Antioch, we too must have a hunger for God's Word. Any church that wants to be all that God intends it to be must be committed to going, growing in the knowledge of the Scriptures and of knowing Jesus. And this really is what discipleship is about. Knowing the Scriptures and knowing Christ. And so our church has a process of discipleship, we call it. A process of discipleship. We talk about it using 
these six words, and I believe they are there on your outline. If you look, our discipleship process includes these words. They, they are descriptive of our process. Belong, connect, grow, serve, give, and go. So we believe that anyone who comes to our church and participates in these six activities, in other words, what those words represent, if you participate in these six activities, we believe you will grow in your relationship with God. Now the word connect involves participation in our life group ministry. It's not the only way that you might connect with our congregation, but one of the, one of the main ways that we try to implement that part of our, our uh, discipleship process is through a small group ministry we call life groups. Now, our life groups gather together, might be in a home, might be here at the church, um, but our life groups study the Word of God together, primary activity. We study the Word of God together. Sometimes these groups will look at apologetics, meaning we look at how to share our faith in a way that is persuasive. We, We do equipping things like training for evangelism. But really the ongoing primary focus of our life groups is the study of the Word of God. Our men's group meets on Saturday mornings at 7 a.m., and we have been studying for some time now the, the Gospel of Luke, and we meet, we read, a, we read a section of it, we discuss it each Saturday morning. Uh, one of our Wednesday night life groups is currently studying the Beatitudes. A second Wednesday night life group is studying the book of Ephesians, um, our, churches, our children's church teaches the Bible to preteens. Our youth group teaches the Word of God to teens. Uh, our Friday night group currently is, is looking at sharing, uh, our, sharing your faith in, in the culture that we now experience in our, in our world, our, our, our country. So these are things that we're doing in our life groups to build one another up, help us to grow in our knowledge of the Word of God and its application and, of course, grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. Beyond that, we have specific things in mind when we talk about the third word that's listed there. The word is grow. So you belong, you come to, to church, you, you uh, identify with our church, you connect then through life groups. The third thing is grow. And uh, as I mentioned, we have some very specific things in mind with that. And so within the ministry that is directed towards grow, we want to we wanna develop certain things that you will do as a follower of Jesus that will enable you to feed yourself spiritually and will set you up, give you a foundation so that you can continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord over a lifetime, right? So one of the things we do, and the first thing we do is to teach people how to pray. Uh, If you remember, this might be the only thing that the disciples asked Jesus to teach them. He said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? John the Baptist teaches his disciples. Would you teach us to pray? And, of course, out of that came what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Um, What we do in in our uh, discipleship ministry under that word grow is we use a workbook called the Workbook of Living Prayer that teaches how to pray. Now the goal of prayer is a life of friendship and fellowship with God, cooperating with the Spirit, living God's will in the world. That's a quote from the introduction of that workbook by Maxie Dunham. Let me read it again. The goal of prayer is a life of friendship and fellowship with God, cooperating with the Spirit living God's will in the world. So we think it important for disciples of Jesus to learn to pray as a relationship with God, an ongoing relationship where we talk with God and we can listen to God. A second thing we do is we think it important that... uh, Disciples of Jesus learn to abide in Christ daily and avail themselves of all the spiritual resources that we have in Christ 
through the power of the Spirit. And sometimes we come to Christ and then we, our growth is stunted because we do not understand how one may abide in Christ, how the Holy Spirit may work in our heart and our life, bringing us into a greater relationship and conformity to the image of God. So we talk about that in this area where we have a workbook called the Workbook on Abiding in Christ. We come alongside you and train you in the context of a small group. We teach you to allow the living Christ to manifest his life in you. We also teach how to use the spiritual disciplines as a means of grace to greater fellowship with God. And that, again, is in the context of a small group. And we can train you for evangelism, and there are several ways we can do that. But those are the things that we do uh, in our discipleship process under the label of GROW. See, we are committed to discipleship as a church and helping everyone grow in the Lord. But in order to grow and to be taught, you must be committed yourself to participating in these ministries that are offered for this purpose. So let's look at the goal for discipleship as, as uh, written here in verse 23. So when Barnabas arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad. Now listen, it says Barnabas encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. So Barnabas saw the evidence of God's grace at work among them. And his initial exhortation, and I would say his continuing exhortation, was to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. Now I've got to tell you, that summarizes basically my whole theology on practical Christian living. If you get your commitment to Jesus right, and you stay in that, so many other things will fall into place. That's why we talk about the lordship of Jesus and surrender to his lordship in your life. And really, that's my own testimony. I mentioned to you in the past how I had drifted from the Lord as a teen. But when I came back to the Lord and he really reached out and grabbed me and brought me back, but when I came back to the Lord, I was determined that I would never waver like that again. And so the best thing I could think to do as, as uh, my early 20s, I started to read the Scriptures every day. I started with Matthew, and I went from one end of the New Testament to the other, reading it, rereading it. Um, and when I finished that, I turned then to the Old Testament and began to read that. And, I mean, my, my reading habit could be described as devouring the Word of God. I read and studied the Bible. And as I did that, the Bible devoured me, is what I discovered. That the Lord transformed my heart, and He transformed my life. I was committed to the Lord, and the Lord was transforming me. And so we mention a commitment to discipleship. A great church is committed to discipleship. And it has to be there. It has to. Let's go on to a fifth characteristic of a great church. It's that it's responsive it's on the back side of your outline. A great church is responsive to the needs of the poor. A great church is responsive to the needs of the poor. And so in verse 27 to 30, we see how this worked out at Antioch at a specific moment, specific occasion, that some prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world, and this happened during the reign of Claudius. 29, the disciples, meaning there in Antioch, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. 
This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. This also, by the way, goes along with one of our descriptors of a discipleship process here in our church. It's under the word give. Uh, generosity, you see, is the mark of a great church. And generosity is part of our discipleship. It's interesting to see how closely concern for the poor is associated with the church throughout the book of Acts. I mean, right at the beginning, on the day of Pentecost, when the church was born, immediately uh, it says that believers sold their possessions and gave to anyone who had need. So they were staying in Jerusalem, and there were people from wide parts of the Roman world who came, right, for the feast that was there. They got converted, and perhaps they stayed a while to be taught apostles' doctrine, remember? Fellowship and prayer, they stayed, and so there would have been people in need among them. So it says that believers who were there sold their possessions and gave to anyone who had need. And that was the example of the church right at the, on the first day uh, that it was born, the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 4, a few chapters later, we learn there was a, nam, a man named Joseph. This is the guy we call Barnabas, right? The apostles renamed him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And what act of faith did Barnabas do that is most proximately associated with his name change to Barnabas? It says, Barnabas, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And they were distributing that then to anyone who had need. If the first Christians associated concern for the poor so closely with their concern for the lost, then shouldn't we as well? When the church at Antioch heard of a need, they gave. The love of God had so touched them that when they heard about the need, they wanted to imitate their heavenly Father by doing good to all men, especially the household of faith. Something Paul wrote about in Galatians chapter 6, and the example that the church should continue in Galatia. Such generosity advances the mission of the church. Christians in the early centuries made a tremendous mark by their loving deeds towards pagans as well as believers. The Roman Emperor Julian, who vainly sought to reestablish the worship of the old pagan gods as a religion of the empire, was enraged at the kindness of Christians. He wrote, Christianity has been especially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care and the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that there is not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the Christians care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. Thus is the testimony of the early church. Brandon O'Brien had been praying regularly with the deacons for one of the church's members. His wife, Pat, attended the small congregation faithfully, but John, Pat's uh, husband, hadn't been to church in many years. So every Sunday afternoon before the evening service, they prayed for ways to communicate their commitment to John and his family. It wasn't long before they received an answer. During the morning service one week, Pat told them through tears that John had been diagnosed with prostate cancer. Surgery was planned for the following week, and doctors were confident John would make a full recovery. The bad news was that John would be out of work for months. He drove a log truck and was paid by the mile. There was no way he could recover while spending 10 hours a day in a bumpy 18-wheeler. But if he didn't drive, well, he wouldn't have a paycheck, and they wouldn't eat. So the congregation sprang immediately to action. There was no question whether the congregation would put, pitch in to support the family in their time of need. So that afternoon, in an emergency business meeting, they sat around a long folding table, and the head deacon, a trucker himself, asked with his characteristic boldness, how much can you give? <laughs> Some pledged 50 or 100 a month. One family committed to pay for uh, the utilities. Another committed to pay for groceries. Whatever the cost, being, beginning immediately then, Anchor Baptist Church took responsibility for the well-being of one of its families. All bills were paid on time. There was a new supply of groceries on the front steps every weekend. Some of the men made sure the lawn was mowed. Others' maintenance issues around the house were addressed. And this 
church took care of Pat and John. John has since rejoined the congregation. Months after his surgery, John testified on a Sunday morning that the church's tireless care of his family had convinced him that the congregation did not simply want another warm body in the seats or an extra dollar in the offering plate. They were committed to sharing their lives and resources with him unconditionally, and he was ready to respond to the grace of God in Christ. You see, a concern for the poor communicates the love of God in tangible ways, and this adorns the gospel of Christ. Such generosity, such compassion, such care is characteristic of a great church. The sixth characteristic of a great church is that it will represent Christ well. It will represent Christ well. Would you look with, with me at verse 26? Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. Now listen to this. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Who called them that? They themselves? No. The people around them, the people of Antioch, the, the unbelievers who were around them began to call them Christians. They were called Christians first. This is the first occasion that this happened at Antioch. Elsewhere, believers in Christ are known as disciples in the book of Acts, for instance or the followers of the way, or they're just strange Jewish believers. <laughs> so why are they called Christians here in Antioch? I think it's a combination of things. First, I think it's significant, significant that the church at Antioch could not be looked on as just a sect of Jews. You see, the disciples in Jerusalem were Jewish believers. They continued to go to the temple, right? They continued to go to the temple for worship, we're told, in Acts chapter 2. They were, they were just another sect of Jews. They had, they had everything in common with the Jews, but they had this belief in Jesus as Messiah. That's what made them different. But they were considered just a sect among the Jewish people. Though they weren't accepted, they were considered uh, a sect of Jews who misidentified the Messiah. But at Antioch, there were Jews and Gentiles together in the same community of faith. And the Gentiles were not made to first become Jews through circumcision and follow the law. So it wasn't a Jewish church. It was a mixed church, and the Gentiles were not made to become Jews, so they were called something different here in Antioch. No longer just Jews, no longer just Gentiles. So they were called Christians here. It was the first church to have this designation. I think a second contributing reason was that in the ancient world, Slaves were called by their master's name. And that may explain how the followers of Christ came to be called Christians in Antioch. Slaves were not their own, you see, and everything they submitted to a higher authority. The disciples of Jesus had critics everywhere they went, and their critics were keen observers. And these critics gave them the name Christians. And the nickname stuck because it fit. Disciples of Jesus submitted to his authority. His word was their command. They obeyed him. They called him Lord. The name Christian, therefore, marked them out as servants of Christ. Last, I think, a contributing factor is because they were Christ-like, Christ-like. When the general population of Antioch looked upon the church at Antioch, they saw people whose lives reflected 
the very character of Jesus. Their generosity to the poor would have been noted. Their ethical character would have stood out. But perhaps the thing that made them most notable was the bringing together of Jew and Gentile into one fellowship. That had happened nowhere else up to this point. Antioch was the first church that was thus integrated. They had overcome the dividing wall of race that had separated Jew and Gentile for centuries. Because of this fact, Paul and Barnabas would go to the Jerusalem council as star witnesses that circumcision and keeping the law was not necessary to salvation. They would testify that Gentiles don't have to first become Jews in order to be saved. Peter would join them in that and his experience of speaking to Cornelius and his household. You see, Christ tore down the dividing wall. They were living out the implications of what Christ had done. Later, Paul would write, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Antioch lived that out, all one in Christ. All cultural, racial, political, and socioeconomic barriers were torn down, and they lived as brothers and sisters in Jesus. This may be the chief reason they were called Christians there, for they all belonged to Christ. It was a radical departure from the rest of society and out of anyone else's experience up to that moment. What if this fact, that we are all one in Christ, that racial barriers are taken down, cultural barriers are torn down, socioeconomic barriers, what if this fact were lived out with full implication in the church in America today? We do have a racial divide in our country. And I believe the cross of Jesus Christ is the only means for uniting what has been separated so long. The church is the only place that this kind of unity, true unity, can occur. And think of the witness to the world that this would be. Think of how it would honor the name of Christ. Atheist Edward Madden took part in a philosophical research project with his Ph.D. student, James Hamilton. They were at Syracuse in the philosophy department there. They collaborated then on a book as a result of the research that was done. And the book was titled Freedom and Grace. Freedom and Grace, The Life of Asa Mahan. Mahan was president of Oberlin College in pre-Civil War days and professor of theology and moral philosophy uh, once at Lane Seminary in Cincinnati and then up at Oberlin. One of his close associates, Charles Finney, played a key role in the Second Great Awakening in America. Mahan was an abolitionist and as first president of Oberlin insisted that Oberlin admit people of all races. Oberlin, I believe, was the first college in America to admit black people. Mahan was a reformer, and he challenged many injustices of his day. As Edward Madden studied Asa Mahan and other Oberlin personalities, as an atheist, he became impressed with their ethic. Oberlin also was the first school to have... Uh, co-eds that were part of the university there. So they challenged many of the injustices of the day. And as Edward Madden studied this and looked at what he saw, he became impressed with their ethic. And he told James Hamilton, a Christian, <laughs> and later my professor and my friend, Edward Madden told James Hamilton, that Mahan and the Oberlin Holiness Movement demonstrated the greatest ethic that he had ever seen. So impressed by this was Madden that in retirement, he moved himself and his wife
to Wilmore, Kentucky, home of Asbury College, because he wanted to live in a community that had ties back to the Christian holiness movement of which Mahan was a part. When will the world respectfully call us Christians? When we honor the name of Christ, by living out his kingdom values. And when will that be? Well, one indication of when this may occur is given by Jesus in John 17. He says when we are truly one, when the church is truly one, where there are no divisions within the church, but we are one in love, then they will know that the Father has sent his Son. Practically speaking, perhaps the church being the catalyst for racial reconciliation within our own nation may be the best opportunity for this to occur. The disciples at Antioch accomplished unity within the church, bringing Jew and Gentile together in one body. And Jesus was pleased to lend his name to the church at Antioch. It's where they were first called Christians. I want to close this whole series that's been about the characteristics of a great church with this. Timothy Keller, prominent contemporary evangelical leader, author, speaker, best known perhaps as pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, I think one of his most helpful gifts to the church is his ability to understand our culture and how to relate the gospel of Jesus Christ to the heartfelt needs of contemporary people. He had this to say about the task of apologetics and evangelism within today's culture. He said, contemporary people outside the church do not care about our apologetic attempts. In other words, they don't care so much if we've come up and can explain reasons to believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, he's not saying this isn't important. He's just saying people outside, they don't care. They don't want to hear your reasons. They don't care about it. They don't care whether it's true because truth isn't that important to them. So, he said, given this state of our culture, he said, our role as witnesses of Christ in this day is to live in such a way that people will want our message to be true. They will want the Christian faith to be true because they see it in you. In other words, if Christians live lives address the things that people care about, like, for instance, the plight of the homeless, racial reconciliation, peace in the world and other kinds of, of uh, issues of justice and that that seem to capture the attention of the world today and really are problems and issues that God has the answer for, if they will see our lives that we have answers to that and that we're addressing these things, these great concerns with wisdom and compassion like Jesus would, if we're making a difference in the world in these things, he says then they will want our message to be true. If Christians can be like that and do that, I want their message to be true and I want to be one like them. Then they will want to hear what we have to say about the truth of the gospel. I think there's a lot in that. <laughs> so when we consider all of these characteristics of a great church that I've talked about. Characteristics that made the church at Antioch stand out. The question is this. Is Christ pleased to lend his name to our church?
is Christ pleased to lend his name to our church? That's a huge question, isn't it? And it's one we're pursuing. Let's pray. Lord, if there is one thing we know, it is that you are the head of the church. You have demonstrated your headship by giving your life, reconciling the world to yourself and your body, and rising again that you might be recognized for who you really are. So it is with joy that we affirm your headship of the church. And Lord, as your body, you have empowered us to carry out your will in this world. Lord, may you give us direction and then willing hearts that we will live it out for the sake of your glory and your name and not our own. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand again and sing our last song. pray with me in closing father thank you for being such a good god i pray as we commit ourselves to you we commit our, uh, our church to you that we would be able to expect and anticipate and be watchful for your hand as we read in acts 11 as well i said your hand was upon them and they grew and lord this is your church and we fully commit ourselves to you. <clears throat> and so, Lord, we, <clears throat> excuse me, we begin to anticipate and expect that. And, Lord, I believe I'm beginning to see signs of your greatness and your hand upon us. Help us to not think that these successes are of our own doing, but of yours, Lord. Lord, as we draw near to you, please keep your promise and draw near to us, as it talks about in James. Lord, we love you. Let this be a church of love among one another and among those that uh, choose to come and visit. And uh, Lord willing, they stay. And Father, thank you for all your goodness. Help us to draw near to you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.